hard to see clear when challenges appear. We get lost inside the emotions we feel. When adversity strikes us down, no need to stay on the ground. Look up, reach out. Do not be afraid, for He is with us, saving us with His right hand of righteousness. So when it gets hard sometimes, we need to remember we're not alone. No, we're never alone. Just pray. Do not be afraid. us friends who stick by our side the prayers of faith and love are always right on time and each day when we read his word it gives us the strength to endure when we're down. We'll reach out. Do not be afraid, for He is with us, saving us with His right hand of righteousness. So when it gets hard, so. Just pray So when those dark clouds come rolling in Hold your head high It'll be
We want to say a very warm and pleasant welcome to all of you. We're going to give the funeral director a few minutes to bring the body to the front before we start our program this evening. So again, we want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you. We are so happy to see so many who have made the sacrifice to be here this evening for the sad occasion, of course, of the funeral service of the late David Ricardo Linton. It's indeed a sad occasion for all of us. And indeed, the family really, really appreciates the support so far that you've been given and the support that we know is going to continue. So we're going to start our program this evening for your song sheets. The song that has been selected is song number 147. It has a scriptural basis, Psalm 37, 29. The theme is life everlasting is promise. In case you don't have a song sheet, the lyrics are going to be on the monitors and you can follow along um, in singing praise to our God. So song number 147, if you can stand, please, you can do so. And let's sing this song together. Shall we pray? Our dear Father and life giver, Jehovah, we come before you this afternoon. It's not a happy occasion. It's actually a very sad occasion because yet again, the enemy 
death has indeed raised its ugly face again. And indeed, whenever a loved one dies, it brings pain, it brings sorrow, and it takes away the happiness that was enjoyed by family members and friends when this loved one departs. And for many, they might think that this is a permanent circumstance where when a person dies, that's it. But we know for sure that you, the giver of life, the same way that you have created life, you can indeed bring loved ones back to life in their resurrection yet again. And this is a promise that you've made and has been guaranteed when you allow your son to die for a distressed mankind after the introduction of Adamic sin in the Garden of Eden. We know that the wages, sin pays death, but as promised in the scriptures, the gift that you have give, given and made available is that of life eternal. So we pray, Jehovah, that this afternoon we'll be able to listen attentively to Brother Lewis as he used your word and clearly explain to us what the condition of the dead is, what is the hope that we can have, and why it is, Jehovah, that when a person like David passed away, that it does not mean that it is something permanent. Life is a gift, and one, Jehovah, that you have promised to those who remain faithful to you. So may you bless us, may you help us to listen very carefully and see where we can apply the information so that we can be better persons. We sin against you in many ways. Please forgive us. At this time, Jehovah, our hearts go out to the family members and close ones to David and help them to appreciate, Jehovah, the comfort coming from your word is indeed a guarantee that we can see a time when these circumstances be things of the past. Please now hear our prayer as we express it to you, and we do so humbly through the name of your Son, our Redeemer, and King, Christ Jesus. Amen. We now invite Brother Trevor Lewis, who is an elder here at the Cave Hill Congregation, who is going to deliver our funeral discourse. We are all of different ages, aren't we? And uh, we would have had certain achievements in life already. But the most precious possession that all of us would have is the life that we enjoy at this time. How much longer we would have this life? We just don't know because life is fleeting it is unpredictable, and it does not provide any security for us. When Adam was created, he was placed in the Garden of Eden, along with the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And so often we, we talk about the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, of which our first parents ate, but hardly would we talk about the tree of life. And perhaps that's because they, didn't give the, they weren't given the opportunity to eat from that particular tree. Now, this tree evidently had no intrinsic life-giving qualities in its fruit, but it represented God's guarantee to life indefinite to the one who would have been allowed to eat from its fruit. Since Jehovah God put the tree there, it was put there for a specific purpose. Undoubtedly, our first parent, Adam, would have been permitted to eat from this tree after proving himself to a point that God considered satisfactory and sufficient. When Adam transgressed, he was prevented from having that opportunity to eat from the tree. In fact, Jehovah says in Genesis chapter 3 and uh, verses 22 and 23, because Jehovah followed up his word with action, as he always does. He says with that Jehovah God expelled him from the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he had been taken. So he drove the man out and he posted to the east of the Garden of Eden the cherubs and the flaming blade of his sword that was turning continuously to guard it to the way to the tree of life. 
if we can have an image as to get a, a picture illustration of some sequence of events in the Garden of Eden. So we had two young looking persons in which they would have been young and they would have stayed that way. If they obeyed, they would have been granted permission to eat of the tree of life. But they didn't. Their indiscretion led to this other image. So here, they were put out of the Garden of Eden so they could not eat of the tree of life which would have enabled them to live forever. As a result of that, look at our third image. Looks quite different from the first image. So they aged and eventually died. And that's what happens to all of us today. Because we came from them. Because we came from them, we all age, we get, we, we grow old, we get sick, and we eventually die. So there's a journey that all hum the entire human race is on. David was on this journey. In fact, the prophet Malachi says that we should be modest in walking with our God. It's not a journey that Jehovah expects us to go on our own. We have to walk with him in order to be successful. This means that we have to have a realistic view of what Jehovah requires of us and of what we can give. David's journey in life started on May 11th, 1960. It was ended on November 29th, 2023. And just to give you a bit of a background, he was the son of the late Selby and Vida Linton, and the father of Dwayne Linton, Don Critchlow, Xavier Jazara, and Julia Linton. He is survived by his siblings, Roderick, Roger, and Takey Linton, Pamela Hill, and Sherry Hackett. He was predeceased by another brother, Kenny Linton. He is the grandfather to Tariq and Tia Linton, as well as Amma Critchlow, and they were there are a number of others. He was also the nephew of Sybil Yearwood, El Rita Spooner, among others. Uncle to Tamisha, Kimar, Dadrian, Rommel Mark, among others. Too, too numerous to mention. We are told that a name or reputation that we make in life it's better than fine oil, according to what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 7 and uh, verse 1. And uh, David made a name for, for himself as an excellent artisan. He performed work at the highest quality. He was also a person of integrity and uh, honesty. Um, I can testify to that because he, he would have done work for, for me and we really had some unfinished work, but I can't, I can't communicate with him any longer and say, well, David, when you come and finish this, this job. And what was also remarkable about David is that you can work next to him, he can, you, can, you can be next to him, and he would show you everything that he is doing. I've been able to do some plumbing and a lot of little bits and things because all I had to do is pick up the phone and call David if he would answer. If he didn't answer, I would have to drive down to his house and uh, get the information, but he was always willing to share information with with me. So when we think about, about life, most scientific investigators not only overlook the cause of death in all mankind, 
But more importantly, they ignore the prime factor requisite for everlasting life. While it is necessary for the human body to be constantly nourished and refreshed by breathing, by drinking and eating, there is something more essential for the continuance of life. Jehovah God made it clear by explaining this principle when he said in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3, not by bread alone does man live, but every expression of Jehovah's mouth does man live. And Jesus Christ repeated it in harmony with what his father says in John 4.34. He says, my food is for me to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So Jehovah God, being the perfect maker, created the perfect man. But not a machine, he created a perfect man. And on the strength of his creatorship, he required subjection from him and from all of us. But of course, we know because we're not machines, we have a brain, we can think, he gave us a choice as to how we're going to exercise the life that he has given since he is the only one that can give it. And that's why when he created man, we're told in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, that we were created in God's image. Now, this does not mean that we have any physical or spiritual appearance of God because he is a spirit and we are flesh. What it does mean is that we are different from unreasoning animals. We have reasoning power. We have the ability to understand why we exist and our creator's purpose toward us. We all have the ability to understand those basic Bible truths. What we do with what we understand is a matter of choice for all of us. We know the consequences of transgressing Jehovah's law because we are a product of those transgressions. Consequently, apart from Jehovah God and his spiritual provisions, there can be no indefinite continuance of life. And that's why when persons die, we often wonder. There are many theories about what persons, what happens to persons when they, when they die because of that desire that we all have to live on. So within our minds, we are thinking, well not we, but some persons are thinking that the, the spirit of this person is living somewhere. But that's not the case because like I said, I can't call David any longer and ask David to do anything. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 9, verse 5 tells us this. Ecclesiastes chapter 9 says, For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing at all, nor do they have any more reward, for all the memory of them is forgotten. And verse 10 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do with all your might, for there is no work, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where you are going. So death is an unconscious state that we, uh, unconscious condition that prevails. And there's no, no work, no planning, nothing we can do at that time. But Jehovah's purpose for mankind has not changed. It just means that <clears throat> <clears throat> we have been led down a different path 
And if Adam was able to eat from the tree of life, none of us would have been here. We are all product of Adam and Eve after he transgressed. If he had children and was obedient, was able to eat of the tree of life, then they were, the entire human race would be quite different. But in as much as we are here and that Jehovah expects to fulfill his original purpose for mankind, we can look forward to the restoration of perfection of our organism and the prospect of eternal life. Jehovah has provided the truth, the word of life. This truth tells us the condition of the dead. And following the truth will lead one to the knowledge of God's provision of Jesus Christ, which he gave himself as a ransom in exchange for many. So based on the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ, here it is, the, the, the scale had to balance in that a perfect human lost perfection and lost life for all his offspring. And so it would require another perfect man, Jesus Christ, as we know in John 3, 16, that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that he so ever exercises faith in him will not perish but have everlasting life. When we think of what the scientists have said about the capacity of the human brain, we ask the question as to why do I have a brain of such capacity and could never use it? It is widely recognized that the human brain far exceeds the use for which it can be put in our present life line. So even if you live 70 years or even 100 years, you still will not use, fully utilize the capacity of the brain. Just like to state what the Encyclopedia Britannica said, that the human brain is endowed with considerable more potential than is reliable, realizable in the course of one person's lifetime. And scientist Carl Sagan states that the human brain could hold more information that will fill some 20 million volumes, as many as the world's largest libraries. Your brain is about the size of a fist. And uh, we are using approximately about one-tenth of a fraction of the brain. The conclusion is that we were really made to live forever. But our journey, just like David's, has been shortened by the Adamic sin, which is a hereditary disease, as it were, that has been passed on to all of Adam's offspring, passed on by him to all all of us now living and who would, have been, who would have passed on in death. David believed in a resurrection, in, in life beyond what we, what we have now. But his belief was life on earth. And he would do so well as a builder because they would be building houses and so on in the new system of things. Now, many believe that, okay, but my destiny is in, in heaven. And so, if you are not one of those who have been chosen for life in the heaven, that somehow you are missing out. But think about it this way. Uh, you remember the days of the theater, the cinema, the um, Plaza and the Empire, some may be too young to remember those, those days. But those movie theaters um, would have a section for what we call the pit. 
the house, and then above you have the balcony and the box. But you know, if I went into that theater to watch Hang Them High by Clint Eastwood, and I'm in the pit, and you're in the balcony, you know we're seeing the same picture? We're seeing the same picture. Right? Even the person that is operating the film, he sees the same picture too. He doesn't see something else. So life, everlasting life, is like that. We all benefit. You know, even though sometimes persons in the pit used to think they see in the picture first. But we all see the same, the same movie. At this time, I want to invite Sister Linton, David's brother, to <laughs> David's sister. I didn't say that, did I? <laughs> yeah, so take it, give us a, a little background as to what it was like being raised with David, your brother. Well, from what mommy had said, mommy said David born a big baby and he continued large as he always loved to eat and he would always eat his siblings food. If you don't be careful, they would not get any, especially Roderick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was very mis mischievous, but he was unassuming. Um, he did like academics and regular on the end of term, he would not even bring a report card. So he used to get a lot of licks for that. <laughs> one, one any term, instead of bringing the report card, he brought home a puppy. <laughs> <laughs> And that was a big joke, but my parents kept the puppy, naming Nip, because he used to bite up everything. <laughs> Anyways, then that, David left home at quite an early age to begin life on his own. And he had a marriage, and that produced two twin children, which was Dwayne and Don. And then after that family wasn't no more, he had another family and he had them Javier, Jazara, and Jalea. But my siblings say that David always made you laugh, his friends say that, that he would always say something to make you laugh. Dwayne said that even if he was vexed, that he would always tell a joke so that they would laugh. He loved his children, but he adored the, the girls. He had a pet name for all the girls. And the girls, told me that when, about seven years ago, he introduced them to chess. And they didn't like chess, but they did it because of him, because they realized that they form a bonding. But they gave me a lot of precious memories of him, and I think that they will continue to keep their memories alive through him. OK, good. Um, they mentioned that the Every year they visited um, Agrofest? Yes, they say that he took them to Agrofest every year. And the last time he took them, he came third in the... <laughs> watermelon? The watermelon competition. They say that they don't know how comes he come third, how comes he didn't get the first. <laughs> 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 but that's their memories of him. They gave me some memories of him. They say that they will always remember their daddy and the time spent with him was very good and bonding. And he always would say to them that chess is not only a game, but it is their life. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Those are some of the things that I share with you all. About Thank him. you very much, Teki, for okay. being so composed and doing so. Yeah, and uh, I can testify to the fact that David loved his children, all of them. I can't tell you who was the favorite, but he just loved all of, all of them. Um, I know this is Duane, and this is the first time I'm meeting you, 
but it was though I've met you before because David talks so much about about you and a lot of tricks that he showed you in working and yes. Um, so from Dwayne right down to Jalea, he was very fond of all the children and he always looked out. He always looked out for them, even, though, even at the expense of himself. Now, I mentioned that David was on a journey, as it is with all of us. Life is like a journey. And uh, you would find some obstacles in the road at times. It is how you deal with those obstacles that will determine how far you get on your journey. Along the way, David became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He was baptized on the 15th of June, 1976. He was born in 1960, so he got baptized at an early age. He was only 16. And uh, coming to meeting was sporadic at, at best, but he always had Jehovah's interests or hosts at heart. He treated this kingdom hall as Jehovah's house. You always talk about Jehovah's house. See this platform here? He was responsible for putting down this platform. And uh, when they were working on it, I remember one brother wanted to put in the nails one way. David said, no, 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 this is Jehovah's house. You got to do it the best way. Because the way he put it down, you would not see the nails. Um, he called them what, the silent nails. Doing is that secret nails. So the nails are here, but it's a secret. It's not a secret any longer because now you know. <laughs> now you know that nails, nails holding the the wood to, together. When we were repairing in the roof, you just got to call David and say we're doing some work at the at the hall. And if David had to forego wages for any amount of days, he would do that to come and work on Jehovah's, Jehovah's house. You know, and Jehovah is not unrighteous to forget your works and the love that you showed for, for him. And uh, we earnestly believe believed that. So, when we attend a funeral, it should remind us as to how uncertain a life is. In fact, in Job chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, Job chapter 14, 1 and 2. It says, man born of woman is short-lived and filled with trouble. Now who can deny that? Life is short-lived, filled with trouble. Verse 2 says, he comes up like a blossom and then withers away. He flees like a shadow and disappears. So that's what happened to David. He would disappear because, as Moses said, when one dies, you go back to the dust. The spirit, in other words, goes back to God because he, as the life giver, holds your future in, in his hands. And that is why we were encouraged by Jesus Christ to store up treasures in heaven because figuratively speaking, whatever treasures you have, you're storing them out of reach. They could never be destroyed. But here on earth, treasures can. And so we want to put our treasures out of reach. So the resurrection hope provides an incentive for us to learn and to do God's will because it is his will that all sorts of persons be saved 
and come to an accurate knowledge of the truth. The truth concerning the condition of the dead. The truth concerning the future for those who die in Jesus' memory. Because he said, those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and uh, come out. We should use this occasion and the days ahead to comfort, to comfort others. We don't want to be like those who have adopted the philosophy of the ancient Greeks. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself, for tomorrow you die. For them, there's no future. But for us, once we've come to an accurate knowledge of the truth, we know that there is a truth, is a future. So we prayerfully look to Jehovah to give us the needed strength, confident that he will provide permanent relief. Our first parents missed out on eating so that they could have indefinite life. We don't want to make that same mistake, but we want to continue to feed on God's word. When we do that, we can be assured that we will be permanent relief from a man's sin, the Adamic sin, the Adamic sin and death. Jesus Christ's ransom will therefore restore position of life to all those who follow Jesus Christ and his father Jehovah, the knowledge of God, so that we can have life and have it eternally. We want to express appreciation to you, Brother Lewis, for helping us by means of your God's word to be able to see how there can indeed be a hope in the future in relation to those who have died. So we are going to bring this part of the program to an end. We are going to have a song after prayer. And the family has also graciously allowed the casket to be reopened for those who would have come after to be able to view for about five to 10 minutes um, because of the, the use of time. So let's sing together first, song number 147. Sorry, song number 151, entitled, He Will Call. Again, the lyrics would appear on the monitor if there's no song sheet in your possession. Song 151.
us pray. Dear Heavenly Father Jehovah, as we come together here, it is to really relive the life of David, but more so for us the living, to live a life that will be memorable like David's. And that is one with you, dear Father. And we, the living, had the opportunity to sit and listen to this discourse, helping us to analyze our lives and how it is going. Dear Heavenly Father, as we sang in the song, friends of our God will never be forsaken. And we know, Jehovah, that you do not forsake those to who show you their loyalty and their love. Because they respect and recognize you as the giver of life, and you're the one that help us to keep moving along in this system of things. And the Heavenly Father, the memories that we just relive through David's family, his children, his siblings, these are memories that will stick with us. The things that would have come about by being friends with him. But dear Father, we come before you because we want to be friends of yours so that even if we should pass away, all hope is not lost. We would have a grand opportunity as your friend to live again. And that is why it's so important, as your word, the Bible says, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the banquet. Because at the house of mourning, we get a chance to sit and analyze our lives and try to adjust and tune it in line with your word and your will for us as humans on this earth. May your Holy Spirit be with the family of our dear loving brother. Because dear Father, at times like this, we need comfort, we need care, and you're the best person to give us this comfort. For you know the heart, you know what pain we're going through. So may your Holy Spirit be with them and be with all of us so that we can keep pressing forward so that in the event one day, if, even if we pass, we can have a resurrection to see David once again and to be joyous beyond compare. So, dear Father, as we move from here, may the Holy Spirit continue to be with us and take us safely to the cemetery and help us always to remember that you are the one that is looking on and keeping us. So please, Jehovah, hear our prayer and bless our efforts, forgive us our transgressions, and we do humbly ask that please, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Lane. We also want to apprise you of the route that the procession will be taking. It will be turning right onto the main road, turning by the shop. We're going to go down the hill, turn onto Grosette's main road, past Rogers Quarry, around the roundabout, straight onto Deacon's Road by the Four Crossing, and right into Westbury Cemetery. It's not mandatory that you follow that, but that's the route that's going to be taken by the procession. At this time, we'll allow the undertaker to open the casket that those who would not have had the opportunity before to view the body to do so at this time, and of course, in a very orderly manner. Thank uh -huh. 
So for those of you who are going to the cemetery, we want to first wish you a very safe travel there. And at this time, the body is going to be making its way to the back. So if we can graciously just make room so that the Paul Bears can indeed carry their duties. So if we can make some room, please, and allow the Paul Bears to carry out their services at this time.
one I speak to says how much they will miss him. And I can speak for myself as, as well. Um, practically every way I turn in my house, I see something that David did. So I'll have that constant reminder. Even if I'm the hall, at the hall, the same thing will be true. Constant reminder that David was here. And as I mentioned, there, there's a journey that we all embark on. Um, his has, has ended, and it's up to Jehovah as to whether there would be a continuance of, of his, his journey. Because Adam was perfect, he lost perfection for all his offspring, and uh, life has become shorter and shorter over the, over the years. Um, Remember a story about this student who was, they were in an art class, and uh, on the paper, this student just put a dot. And uh, the teacher asked the student, but what is this? I thought you were drawing a plane. He said, this is a plane that's going out of sight. And so it is with life as it is from perfection we, uh, we have moved so far down the line that we are just about a dot as far as life is concerned today. But Jehovah will change all of that. In fact, the man Job, in Job chapter 14, 14 and 16, this is what he said. He asks a rhetorical question. He says, if a man dies, can he live again? And he was able to answer his own question. He says, I will wait all the days of my compulsory service until my relief comes. You will call and I will answer you. You will long for the work of your hands. So Jehovah longs to bring back persons from the dead. But he's not impulsive as the way he does things. There's also there's this timetable that he has, and he will not act until that appointed time comes. He may very well have an appointed time for David. But in the meantime, we have to look at our own circumstances, our own life, and see how we are measuring up to the standard that he has set. So Revelation chapter 21, verse 1 through 5, the, the, the scripture that forms the basis for the song, See Yourself and All is New, Song 1, 30, 39, gives the assurance of the better life to, to come. So if you can, we'd like you to join us in singing Song 1, 39. At this time, we can ask that the, the casket be lowered.
as we all know, life is a treasured possession. There is no price tag that you can attach to life because life resides with one person, that is Jehovah, Jehovah God. And as was mentioned, his original purpose for mankind remains the same. He does not de determine the composition of the new world. We determine that by the way we live our lives, availing ourselves to the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is the only means by which man can have life because Jesus Christ has interceded on behalf of mankind by giving his life as a ransom so that indeed we can have life and have it in abundance. So song number 18, based on Luke chapter 22, verse 20, carries the team grateful for the ransom. And just don't see it as a song, but bear in mind the words and the hope that they would have meaning for you. Song number 18. There's no doubt, as the Job said, that man is full of trouble. Man born of woman is full of trouble. And uh, we go through various things in life. But one of the things Apostle Paul says that each person would carry his own load. So there's a load of responsibility that we all have. However, we are told in Psalm 55, to throw our burden on Jehovah. So there are going to be challenges in life that we need intervi divine intervention in order to cope. And Jehovah is saying that I am there to help you with the burden, but you must carry the load of your responsibility. And we need to do that admirably if we're going to gain a life. So song number 55 
encourages us. Psalm 55 and Psalm 33 encourage us to throw your burden on Jehovah. Everything that Jehovah promises will come true. And I say that dogmatically. They will come true. John 3.16 gives that assurance, and the Bible is replete with information which speak to Jehovah's promises. Song number 140 comes with the theme, Life Without End at Last.
belasmal. We mentioned that life is a journey, and uh, it's a journey that we do not have to, to go on our own because we are assured that Jehovah is capable of taking that journey with us. And so we want to sing this final song, that's song number four, titled, Jehovah is my shepherd. Then we'll have a closing prayer. To you, our Father, Jehovah in the heavens, we come before you with heavy hearts. But we hold you in high regard as our, our shepherd. You know what we truly need. 
would love to see an end to death and all the things that cause mankind suffering. But as we will be reminded very soon that we continue to wait eagerly on you. And showing a waiting attitude means that we try our best to ensure that our relationship with you remains strong. We try our best to apply what we learn and understand. And when we reflect on uh, lives uh, such as um, Brother Linton and what he did for, for you, the love that he had for you, we recognize that these thing, when these things happen, it really helps us to see how we really long for your, your new day to come. And so we, we continue to look to you as a God who will comfort us. Uh, we, in turn, when we are comforted, as your word tells us, we comfort others. And we can do so by means of being reminded of the wonderful hope of a resurrection, which is only possible by means of the ransom provision of your son, Jesus, who lived a perfect life, one that we can try our best to follow and be reassured of the wonderful hope that those who we love, those who have lost, been lost in death, will not be lost forever because we know that your limitless memory will always have them there and we can trust that you will, will reward them when the time is right. So continue to be with the uh, Linton family and others who continue to um, grieve. You know that the grieving process doesn't have a particular time frame, but we know that you will always be available to provide the needed help and comfort necessary to get them through such a very difficult and challenging period. Take us to our homes um, safely. We understand because of the inclement weather, it, it could jeopardize our safety, but we hope that everyone here will be able to get back home safely. And always try our best to remember the family as the days and weeks go by, because it's so easy to go back to our regular lives and, and forget days like these. So do hear our humble prayer and expressions of thanks. We also beg the forgiveness of our sins. And this we pray humbly through the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, On behalf of the entire Linton family, relatives, um, friends, we appreciate your turning out today. Um, we know it would have taken some sacrifice of, on your part, and we really do appreciate it is an indicative of the type of friendship and bond that David would have formed with many of you, whether working or just on a, on, on a casual, casual, casual basis. And may Jehovah the God of comfort continue to be with you. And uh, we trust that the words we use from God's word, those words do not get lost on you, but to really understand that there's continuance of life that Jehovah provides as long as we draw close to him. Uh, so once again, we thank you. And again, we continue to extend our condolences to the to the Lintons and extended family. So like many mentioned in the prayer, I really trust that you will travel safely and uh, as an opportunity for us to continue to reflect on the lives that we live. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks very much. Mm. Be rather, be kind. Mm -hmm.